Ladies and gentlemen, very welcome back to Cooperative City. This time, I'm not calling you from my garden, as you can see, and I was actually wondering whether it would be nice to have a call from the garden, but no, we're no longer in quarantine. So here I am from our Eutrophian office in Rome. And this is the whole point of uh, this new series of webinars that we are starting today, which is Cooperative City in Dialogue. Fortunately, no longer under the, 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 the pressure and the stress of the quarantine condition, we are now in a position where we have to think about the future of our cities. There's a lot of debate in Europe about what this will happen in terms of policies, in terms of finances. And this is the opportunity for all the initiatives that are following cooperative city, that whether these are NGOs, whether these are projects fostered by the city council, whether these initiatives from the private sector or research projects or research and action projects from the university, we try to bring you all together in this cooperative city in dialogue to really try and get together towards building better cities for ourselves. Now, you might remember that the last episodes of Cooperative City in Quarantine, we built together many of the speakers that joined throughout a, a numerous uh, series of, uh, of, uh, of webinars and discussion on a wide range of topics. We built together a, a manifesto for social economy in Europe. We had a final event in June where we invited representatives from the European Commission, from the DGs, um, and from different organizations that are, are running uh, EU-funded programs to join us and discuss with us what they see from the perspective of their organizations and their departments as a future for social economy to really foster social inclusion and not leave anybody behind in European cities. And we had a very interesting uh, feedback on what were the possibilities. Now, after a couple of months, after the summer break, we want to restart this moment. And throughout the coming months, every two weeks, we will be having a series of events all together at lunchtime this time. And we hope that as many of you are working from home, we hope that this is a nice opportunity to have a lunch break together, have a chat, join us, write to us any comments and ideas that you have on, uh, on our Facebook channel, and we'll be happy to answer back to you. Today, the, the moment that we're taking and to start the new series of Cooperative City Dialogues is to bring together some of the initiatives from out, throughout Europe that have been working on social, on social economy and to try to look into how from the initiatives that we invited to build up the manifesto, we, bought, um, we tried to build together a manifesto, an idea that you find on cooperativecity.org. Now, today, the discussion is how do we transform this in reality? How do we really make sure that we can carry out actions and that initiatives of social economy are not just ideas? They're not only marginal uh, initiatives of uh, very idealistic communities, but they are a new experimentations of how regular economy should be, really ensuring that regular mainstream economy will actually have more and more social, and it's not just a uh, form of social washing, but it's radical impact on the territory. And this is why today we will be having uh, a sum up of what were the discussions that we had uh, in, um, in June. So we're looking into what was the manifesto that we started from. And then we have in, in, uh, input coming from Rui Franco, uh, head of the uh, president of the CLLD network in Lisbon, the community-led local development network, which is funded through uh, an EU instrument that is fostering community-based urban transformation. And from uh, Lavinia Pastore, who is one of the co-founders of Open Impact, which is an organization in Rome, um, working on assessing social impact of projects uh, on a global scale, actually. So we will be very interested in hearing what they think are the next steps. But before going further, I think we need to start looking into where what, what was the starting point. And this is where I would like to get with you today, looking into um, the very, the very starting point of, uh, of our discussion last time, which was the manifesto. Now, as you will remember, the manifesto started from a number of, of meetings that took place um, 
from when did the quarantine start? Now that was March, wasn't it? It, it feels like it was it was a, a different era, and we're curious to know also from from you. Please write in the call in the in the chat. What is the situation in your city? What is the situation in your countries at the moment? Because it's very important to keep this dialogue going. Now the first moment for us is really to look into what was that came out out of 14 episodes where we had so many speakers, so many people joining us. And it was fantastic. We calculated that we had 48 speakers joining us. We had um, thousands of interactions with many of you. And, but these are numbers that don't really count so much. What we really see is the fact that we're trying to bring forward uh, a dialogue. And this is what we're trying to do. So please, Dialogue does not just come from us, it has to come also from you. So share with us your ideas. This said, I would like to share with you at this point, the manifesto, which is the starting point from which we discussed, we will discuss today. And if technology is on my side, I might actually get to share with you the manifesto. So thank you very much. We advocate for existing knowledge, policy recommendations, and financial resources to be geared towards the strengthening of social and solidarity economy practices throughout Europe. We believe that this is the way forward to not leave anyone behind. During the COVID-19 crisis throughout Europe, we have seen solidarity practices, essential welfare services being developed by civic organizations often in cooperation with the local authorities and businesses. Furthermore, we have seen that social purpose companies were more resilient in this crisis than simple for-profit companies. Aside from the dramatic health crisis, we know that we have only seen the tip of the iceberg in terms of socio-economic impacts that the coronavirus will have on our society. We face an increase in poverty, a rise in unemployment, at the same time, there is a great potential in social and solidarity economy in Europe. While social businesses have different legal forms and operate in a wide range of sectors, they all pursue a social mission within their business activity. In the face of the upcoming economic and social crisis, we advocate for Europe to support the social and solidarity economy as an opportunity to ensure economic sustainability to all those people who are already in a condition or at high risk of poverty. We need to ensure policy support to solidarity practices as a means to strengthen our democracy. We need capacity building for enterprises and public authorities to be competitive. We need solidarity funds, grants or revolving funds to support social and solidarity economic initiatives. But funding is not only expressed in terms of financial liquidity, it also means access to space to pursue socially relevant services and investing in human capital through better labor conditions. These are not new ideas for the EU, which has greatly invested towards better knowledge, better policy and better funding. But it's time to put in place those ideas rapidly and back them up with the necessary financial resources. This manifesto is currently being subscribed by many organizations in Europe. It's a starting point for dialogue and action to take place. Join us. We hope that you agree with the, with the manifesto and that you will, together with the many organizations that have been signing it, it's over 70 already have signed the manifesto, we will try to push forward the discussion and the European debate. Of course, there's so much work to be done. There's already a lot of international organizations that are carrying out debates in this and, and networking and lobbying at this level. So we don't want to overlap with existing, with existing ones. Uh, we want to strengthen and we want to combine the efforts in really trying to bring forward the discussion at the, the European level, because we believe, especially in this moment, in the light of the coronavirus, there is the need for this and there's a big debate around Europe about what will be the future of the European finances. There will be um, 
many, many financial allocations coming up in the next years. Uh, and this is the opportunity to make sure that the money is also geared with a real impact on the ground. So we don't believe in the fact that there should be a portfolio of money that is specifically labeled as social economy, but we think that every activity, every expenditure should also include a social impact and should be evaluated and pursued because of the fact that it really has a social impact. Now, as you will remember in June, we brought together um, different, uh, different stakeholders working in the environment and the ecosystem of European organizations. And in particular, we would like to share with you the message that came from the, um, the, the, the vice president of the urban intergroup of the European Parliament, which has been, um, is, is one of the members of parliament that is responsible for, for uh, pursuing the discussions on the debate on cities. So we believe that uh, there is space and to be listened and to pursue the work that is being done. And we would like to share with you the words that uh, came, from, came to us from um, the head of the, uh, of the intergroup, the vice head of the intergroup. As vice president of the urban intergroup, I think it is specifically important to underline the social function of cities. This is affordable housing. This is communal planning, especially in the field of traffic, of public transport. The possibility also that city-owned facilities like public transport, like uh, water services, like uh, other public services are not under pressure. And especially in these days of climate change and COVID-19, it is important to underline how important is social systems, how important is a good functioning health system, and how important is also to think about the future in the climate change. This means green cities, sustainable cities, sustainable ways of transport, sustainable ways of energy production could be also happening in the cities. Let's think about the rooftops where we can put also solar panels and also how we can make cities, especially in climate change, more livable means greener cities and cooler cities. More trees, more water, more better life for those which cannot afford to have a swimming pool in their shadow garden. So there is, there is a sensibility that we can work on within the institutions of the European Union. Of course, there's a lot of different interests and a lot of different pressures, but there is space to bring forward the issues that of the many organizations that are following our debates since, uh, since quite some time and our articles on cooperative city um, to really try and push forward. What are the real needs on the ground? And this is what we would like to know from you. Now, without further ado, I would like to also now uh, share with you the insights of, of um, a less political uh, perspective, always within the EU. Many of you might know the Urban Innovative Action Programme, OUYA, which is a European programme that finances cities, quite self-evidently, to carry out innovative actions on a number of topics that are related to the EU urban agenda, which was a document that was um, signed during the Dutch presidency back in 2016, in which all member states committed to bring forward uh, cities towards a number of topics ranging from digital transition to inclusion of migrants and refugees, fostering social housing, but also uh, promoting sustainable land use, from promoting circular economy to tackling urban poverty. On a number of topics, uh, cities throughout Europe have been pioneering uh, projects thanks to the support of the Urban Innovative Action Programme, which is a programme that fosters approximately up to 5 million euro in a city and where it's not only the city council, the city administration that is the beneficiary of the project, they are the lead partner, they are the representative at the local level that will carry out the activities. But most importantly for us, the, pro the thing is that the, the, the OUYA program fosters local partnerships. So there has to be representative from private sector, from research and from social organizations that work together in developing a local project that will have an innovative impact on one of the challenges that our cities are facing. And I would like to share with you the words of Raffaele Barbato, who is um, the, uh, 
program coordinator within the OUYA, who has been sharing with us, based on the inputs of the manifesto, what are the future impacts that the, um, that the OUYA program could have uh, in European cities. So I would like to share with you the words from Raffaele. Thank you very much for inviting me to provide a message to such a, um, to this webinar to present such a relevant and timely manifesto that you, you produced uh, recently. From our perspective, from the perspective of UIA, the predominance, the importance of the solidarity economy and the social innovation can be seen at different levels. We can see that cities are more and more testing and experimenting kind of variable geometry of, uh, of partnership in the way of delivering uh, their, 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 their ideas and their solution. So here we are moving to a process of co-design, to a process of co-implementation. And of course, uh, this is also uh, quite innovative for cities because probably uh, cities have been used to, to test such uh, uh, delivery models with more traditional type of actors like university, chamber of commerce, but now that they are doing it with NGOs, with uh, cooperative models, with uh, social innovators, of course, this is a total new uh, field where they have to, to define the right uh, mechanism the right vehicles to keep them together and keep working while the city sometimes is taking a step back and playing more a role of ecosystem manager rather than main service provider. So this is another very interesting trend that we can see when solidarity uh, economy uh, actors are involved in a UIA project, they are innovating not only in the type of services that they are trying to deliver, but also in the relation that they are establishing with the, um, the, UI, the UI projects and the, 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 the urban authorities. So if I look, let's say, at the three uh, objectives, which are also the three strands of activity of the uh, urban, urban agenda and applying to this conversation that we are having today, I think that if we start from the better policy type of strand, what we need to, to find, what, what the, the policymakers need to work on is to better define exactly such a legal mechanism that may uh, facilitate this relation between urban authorities is solidarity actors and community in order to have this generative model of welfare states. Uh, here, there are already, I don't think that we have to reinvent the wheel. There are already a number of uh, mechanisms that are existing that probably need to be further analyzed and elaborated. Here, I'm referring, for example, to the experience that in Italy we had uh, regarding the common goods legislation in Torino, Bologna, or Napoli, but also to some uh, reflection that is now going on uh, with in the framework of the public procurement for innovation with this idea of the public community partnership that might be already possible within the, 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 the public procurement for innovation type of um, legislation or um, reinforcing uh, some experience like the CLLD, uh, the urban CLLD uh, that, for example, have been uh, tested uh, quite successfully in Lisbon with the big zip uh, experience. So I think there are already some tools, there are already some mechanisms to frame such a relation, but we have to work a bit more in order to make them much more accessible and even probably more recognizable to, uh, to urban authorities and community in order for them to be used more and more. Uh, that's the first part. I think then it's a kind of, let's say, uh, interlinked uh, reflection on the better financing. If we are able to define which is the delivery mechanism for cities and solidarity economy to implement their ideas, I think it would be much easier also for such new partnership to attract uh, EU funding. For time being, and we see it sometimes also at UAE, it's quite difficult to uh, reach directly with the financial aid, the financial flow, uh, actors that are not from the, let's say, public sphere, from the, from the public uh, uh, context. So I think that once the, 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 the legal uh, mechanism has been better defined, it would be much easier also to um, uh, channel the, the EU resources that are available. And by the way, there will be more and more uh, available in the, in the future for this specific type of issue uh, to toward these new mechanisms. 
regarding better the better knowledge i think this is something that of course as you can understand uh, it's uh, very much important from our point of view because in uae as you probably know we have the, the, the second main uh, strategic objective is to capture the knowledge that U.S. cities are generating to inspire other cities in Europe. So I think that this is one field where definitely uh, the, 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 the type of networking activities, the capacity building activities, the capitalization type of activities can be extremely helpful. Uh, and I'm sure that there will be a lot of cities in Europe that will be looking forward to be inspired uh, by these type of practices. So definitely, thank you to Raffaele for sharing this uh, this interesting perspective from the UIA. Now, the point that 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 uh, that Raffaele Raffaele makes a lot of very interesting points here. But let's let's try to build on some of the some of the most relevant. And I think one of the most important things that we see here is that there are spaces also um, without entering marginality conditions to bring forward. Um, experiences of, of, of social economy in a strong way and this is very 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 relevant and this is where we ask you to you know share your experiences tell us what has been happening in your cities um very interestingly Raffaele points out to a series of aspects that are connected to really strengthening local ecosystems of social economy because for economy obviously to be uh, to be effective on the territory it cannot be a number of very isolated initiatives that try to create their niche it has to be a cohesive ecosystem um he mentions it mentions as one of the initiatives that are uh very good references the case of the bipsip in lisbon now some of you might know the bipsip some of you might not BIPSIP is a program that was carried out over the last 10 years in, in Liz, the city of Lisbon as a result of the 2008 economic crisis to foster social inclusion, social cohesion and empower local citizens in so-called priority neighbourhoods in order to tackle poverty. As a result of a 10-year program that has carried out grant systems, that has carried out um, administrative uh, integrated uh, structures, uh, and a very, starting from a detailed mapping of the city based on, uh, uh, on a various indicators that would show the, the, the conditions of marginality in the city, it was possible to also set up a CLLD, a community-led local development program, which is an instrument coming from the EU uh, that was tested in very few cities uh, in this period of 2014-2020 EU funding. And we would like to have with us uh, Rui Franco telling us about how does the CLLD actually tackle, how does it offer an opportunity to tackle urban poverty in, uh, in the city of Lisbon? How can we learn from this experience also in other cities? And how can we make sure that the CLLD instrument is actually taken uh, from uh, member states in this moment because the issue is that in this moment member states are discussing with the European Union about the financial instruments and the financial allocation and priorities that will be uh, addressing the 2014 uh, the 2021 2027 EU funding period on top of all the discussions that are already there about the EU New Green Deal, about the recovery fund and so on, let's not forget that the EU funding anyway runs as in its regular so-called activities, hopefully taking very much on board what we are trying to learn from the COVID experience in the 21-27 period. And this is the moment in which our member states can decide whether they will adopt innovative instruments of making sure that local communities can co-manage the financial resources and to develop new ways of participatory decision making also through EU finances. And the experience from Lisbon is something we can definitely share for and I would like to introduce you to Rui Franco from Lisbon. CLLD uh, is an European program uh, that inherits the, the experience from the, the previous programming periods from the leader program, which was basically for rural uh, context, which since 2015 was transformed into this uh, by the CU regulation in 2015, 
what is called community-led local development, which works with several different funds from the rural, the fisheries, but also ERDF and ESF. And for the first time, it defines three fields of three kinds of territories for CLD to be implemented, the rural, the fisheries, and now for the first time since 2015, the urban context, and uh, aims to uh, establish uh, what they call, what the regulation calls partnerships, urban partnerships, uh, or local action groups, using the same acronym that came, comes from the, the leader program of local organizations working in a specific city uh, on social territorial cohesion and very focused on the most deprived urban areas of a specific city. And where these organizations together, and they, they can be established or as a consortium or as an, uh, a specific association, which is the case of Lisbon, where in a democratic uh, organization, uh, let's call it, I will call it, a, in the case of this, a kind of federation of a lot of these uh, local NGOs, typically mainly NGOs, although there is meant to have a balance between public, the public sector, the private for profit sector, and the, the non for profit organizations working in this uh, deprived neighborhood. To start, we, we've been negotiating since the, the, the creation of the, the CLLD network in 2015 uh, to have as much, to, to manage as much funding as possible and then to adapt it, to translate the fulfillment of the European, of the fund uh, rules uh, for them to become accessible, understood and accessible to this uh, typically very small local organizations like uh, the biggest uh, group of those are res typically residence unions but also cooperatives and a lot of others. Um, we do capacity building so we help local organizations to understand and to be able to design an application. We monitor the, the impacts, uh, but then directly the, 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 the network uh, also runs specific uh, uh, programs to empower the local organizations, uh, but also to, to make them as linked as possible to the wishes and the needs of the communities themselves. That's why the, in this case, the, the decision on which applications to be to get funded not also happens with independent jury. All the residents living in these neighborhoods in Lisbon, and we are talking about almost a third of the Lisbon population, is now voting on which projects they want to get funded in their neighborhoods. Uh, we are uh, about to open a significantly big, uh, what we call uh, the CLD Lisbon Resource Center, where it will, it will be open as a, a kind of incubator for, for the NGO, so a big physical infrastructure where, where they can have their own offices, their own services to the communities. Uh, and we are also creating some overall infrastructure to, to boost, the, to enhance the, their, their impact. And a good example for that is a, a community currency where most of the, the, the products and services of all these projects across the city will use not only to exchange and share uh, resources from, from each specific organization with the other uh, neighborhoods, but also to uh, engage uh, the city economics, like from tourists, from all the people, to, to induce them to 
consume more local and more products and services from these projects. Uh, so to capture value from the, the city finance to, to improve the, the trade balance between these neighborhoods and the, and the local organizations and the general city economics. So we are now distributing 5 million euros to local projects and the CLLD itself has an extra uh, 20, almost 25% of that for this uh, capacity building activities and central activities like the currency and others and the resource center. And now we sign a, a contract with the city which not only the, the use of a, a big public building to be for this resource center, uh, and uh, some some other human and technical uh, resources from the city, which are now delivered to be managed by the by the CLLD network, an extra three hundred and fifty thousand euros a year to from the city to to boost the this technical assistance and the and the resource center activities. The CLD uh, methodology uh, is way more efficient uh, application of uh, significant public budgets uh, than any other instrument uh, experienced before. Um, and that we believe that we've proven uh, that it addresses the, the real needs, uh, the statistical and also the perception of the the most deprived uh, communities, which are often, uh, which are otherwise not able to access the and to benefit from this funding. And uh, so now we believe that for the next programming period and with the, the COVID uh, financial and economic and social impact needs to be enhanced so that the available European budget can be more efficient uh, can be replicated for other areas of intervention uh, because it's more democratic, it's efficient, it can, there is no reason not to be applied in many other fields rather than just uh, education, uh, employment and inclusion. Um, and it, it transforms the way communities and especially the most deprived communities trust and, and understand and take part of the, the public management and the, the, the relationship between what Europe values are about and how they are uh, transcribed in, in the change of the real life of the most needed citizens. So thank you, Rui, for sharing this. Um, CLLD is, a, is an instrument that is adopted actually nowadays in very few cities around Europe. Lisbon is one of them, um, which is a city that has a very strong political support in fostering um, social inclusion, social economy to tackle urban poverty in the city. Um, but it's possible to only have really strong political support because there is a very strong base on the ground of organizations, of people, of initiatives, of cooperatives that are working to tackle the challenges that the city is facing. Now, within this context, what we see, and this is where we were really inviting you to listen to the words of Rui, and you can find on cooperativecity.org further information, further articles on the experiences from Lisbon, on CLLD, on other cities in Europe that are working on CLLD, like the city of The Hague in the Netherlands. Um, and this is a starting point for us to really start thinking about what can be done in other cities. We don't have to wait until the CLLD instrument is adopted also at local level. It could be that maybe for some reason it doesn't happen, but we can still learn from the initiatives that are being done. One of the issues, as we saw from what the manifesto was saying, that because it came out from all the discussions that Raffaele was saying, that um, Rui now was saying, is the fact that we need to have financial resources we need an access for space. So for example, Lisbon is starting up the resource center that will be somehow a house for all the initiatives in, uh, that are involved in the CLLD to also foster capacities 
capacity building because this is fundamental and uh, we need to create this as opportunities of labor and this is why the social we're not only talking about social inclusion we're talking about social economy we're talking about having an impact on the ground also in terms of how the finances are redistributed and how people have are in a condition of working so fair labor conditions are fundamental now within this, basically we're talking about impact. And this is why, just as Rui was saying in the last question, what is the value of CLLD? Well, the value is the fact that it has an impact on the ground. But how do we evaluate the impact on the ground? How are we able to make sure that the impact on the ground becomes something tangible, that it's not just a narrative, but it's something that can actually be an evidence-based uh, discussion to with decision makers, with politicians, with financial institutions, how can we actually bring uh, evidence to go and, and, and show the fact that there is real change that can happen on the ground if we really bring together all of these social initiatives to try to create a change. And this is where I would like to share with you the insights coming from La Vigna Corvo, uh, La Coming from Lavinia Pastore, forgive me, Lavinia, I mixed up also with your colleague Luigi Corvo, and both of you are co-founders on uh, in the Open Impact, um, which is an organization based in Rome that is specialized on assessing social impact in projects. And I would like to share with you the words from Lavinia, because this is really, really important uh, and a really, really important uh, element in this moment. Open Impact is, uh, it was a research project that now is a startup and a spin-off in which uh, we uh, investigate the topic of social impact, of impact. Uh, the, the idea of the startup is to build a database in which we are collecting all uh, social impact assessment that we found open access. And we want to help uh, on one side the public administration and authorities and on the other um, enterprises and social enterprises to build their activities towards uh, social impact. What does it mean? It means that uh, we believe that uh, the issue of uh, impact is not something that should be only related to evaluation, but it should be embedded when uh, a company think about their activities, so they should design their value chain according to the impact that they want to generate, and at the same time, a program, a policy, should be based on the impact that they want to achieve. They should design their impact, and then, of course, this impact should be monitored, measured, and evaluated. We believe that the social impact is so important because it represents the way in which one of the way in which we can measure, in which we can give a, a metric to what we do. Uh, at this present time, we have only the economic metric. So we evaluate uh, activities and policies only if they actually achieve some economic re results or when we talk about uh, grants, we just evaluate if that money was spent and how, but we don't go further. We don't go to see what was created through that uh, uh, program policy project. So this is why we think that uh, each uh, project, for instance, but each program or policy should have uh, expected income uh, impact that they want them to evaluate and to monitor through time. In this way, it, it would be easier to also to design the future policies because we, uh, the idea is that we should collect also data that is not only related to economic performance or to uh, the European Fund, for instance. But we would like to know what happened and what were the outcomes there, what, uh, what the impact left by those projects. And of course, we also think that one single project cannot have a, a specific impact if it is not embedded within a program and then a policy that has a clear expected impact that they want to generate. This is why the policy and the program should have macro areas of outcomes that they want to achieve and the project 
should be or, um, somehow already embedded in this vision and they should be also funded with the idea that through many projects that outcome area, that impact will be reached. Otherwise, the risk is that is the fragmentation. There are so many beautiful projects, but they don't want to achieve the same impact if they are not guided by a vision uh, that should be designed by the policymaker. Uh, I think that the, I agree with the manifesto and the, I absolutely share the vision that uh, you are describing in the manifesto. And I think that social impact could be a tool through which you implement this kind of vision. What does it mean? The point is that uh, the, the future, the next fund that, uh, uh, that we are going to have, they are going to be crucial. Of course, because uh, we are also um, in an economic crisis. And this is a, also a big uh, chance for us to experiment a different kind of economy and a different kind of incentives. Because uh, if we embed the concept of impact, that it means uh, in, uh, in a practical way, the idea that we also collect data on social and environmental uh, uh, goals that the, the program, the policy has, has decided. In this way, we can also uh, have a better um, planning for the next, uh, um, the next uh, years. And we can also modify, little by little, uh, the economic system. Because if we think about social economy as a small part of the whole economy, uh, we think, uh, I think, it is uh, a mistake because the social economy can become can become the actually the um, the mainstream economy. The point is that it has to be supported because, of course, uh, a lot of the um, of the logics, a lot of uh, the um, the mechanisms that are behind social economy are somehow against the market logic. So they need to be supported and how can we evaluate also the other impacts that they generate. Nowadays, when we say, yes, social economy does not generate the same margin, for instance, does not generate the same profit of for profit economy, but usually it's just a sentence. We say, yes, but there are so many other impacts that they generate. Uh, the suggestion of open impact and uh, all the impact economy is to start to actually monitor, first of all, design and then monitor and evaluate those other parts that are actually embedded in our economy and that in the medium and long term can uh, generate a more sustainable society, a society that is more um, balanced. Uh, thank you so much, Lavinia Pastore, for sharing with us uh, the, the experience of uh, Open Impact, but especially explaining to us why it's so important to be able to assess the social impact. Because it is true, when there are projects of, uh, with, with a social impact, very often we say maybe this, the economic impact is not so strong, but there are other impacts as well. But we have to be able to also quantify this and to be able to actually show this as a, as a matrix of values that have to be put on, be put on the table to be able to ensure that there, there is a social cohesion and that we're not leaving anybody behind. We hope that you enjoyed the discussions of today. Um, uh, we will, over time, also have moments with, uh, with, uh, with remote discussions. We hope to slowly start also sharing with you events that take place directly here, maybe with a couple of speakers with masks and, and, uh, and social distancing, but to be able to also have uh, a more interactive live discussion. And we're looking forward to having your questions, your comments that you can always share on the Facebook page of Cooperative City or at the email info at cooperativecity.org. You can always share any suggestions if you have, for example, an interesting initiative that you would like to highlight. Uh, we will be meeting from now on every Wednesday at 12.30 CET, Central European time, as it has been today. 
and we hope to be with you on the lunch break. I am about to have a very unexciting uh, salad, but um, I hope your lunch is, have, is being more and more interesting and more exciting. And the idea is that as many of us are still working in some forms of uh, smart working, maybe from home, not having the opportunity to really uh, exchange with, uh, with your colleagues, with your friends, also on an international level. The aspiration that we have here is to keep you company during the lunch with um, for an hour to discuss about some of the issues that are ahead of us. And I'd like to, the, the Cooperative City Dialogues will take place, as we said, every two weeks on Wednesday, 12.30 to 13.30 Central European time. The next episode will be looking into uh, the role of social economy in cities with testimonies from cities from the Danube region as part of uh, our Agora project. Um, and we will be experiencing uh, stories of how cities throughout, uh, throughout the Danube region, which goes from, from Germany, Austria, but going down to, to, um, to Romania to, 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 um, to see how the different cities are responding to the opportunities that social economy offer to really transform and regenerate our, our cities. Um, and we will be having different cities, different social initiatives, uh, different researchers joining the discussion on the 30th of September at 12.30. We will be also having a very interesting debate on the 14th of October that will be looking into placemaking actions during the winter time. So how can we actually, um, what, how are cities actually responding and how is this an opportunity once again to ensure that in our public space, we make sure that we really include everybody. You will find on our Facebook and on our website, cooperativecity.org, uh, the calendar and you're very welcome to join us anytime. Um, we thank everybody that has been following us today because we know that the communications have arrived um, maybe not as in advance as they would have come uh, in, in the past. So we, 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 we also hope on, on your support to spread the word around. And we would like to thank all our partners that helped us in, um, in bringing this, uh, this, uh, this episode together. So first, first and, and foremost, um, all the Utropian team because many, very often you will find some of us, like myself, who are maybe the spokeswoman or spokesman of, uh, on behalf of Utropian, but there is a whole team behind that, that works on, on making uh, these initiatives possible. So I would like to thank all my team, first and foremost. But especially for today, I would like to thank Raffaele Barbato. I would like to thank uh, uh, Ms., uh, Andrea Schneider from the European Parliament. I would like to thank Rui Franco from the CLLD Lisbon, and I would like to thank Lavinia Pastore from Open Impact. But also the, the structural um, uh, a partnership also go with a number of projects like, such as Open Heritage, such as JECO, such as Wonderland, um, such as Agora, who are helping us on uh, each of the episodes to build the, the program together. So this is why this is an invitation to any of you. We are building the, 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 the calendar for the months of September, October and November, but there are plenty of opportunities for building episodes together. So any of you who would be interested, drop us a line. We're happy to discuss and speak with you. And this said, um, for any of you who haven't had the opportunity to join us live, the episodes are always uh, then repost available on the Facebook page anyway, but then also reposted on our website. This said, I can only thank you so much for joining me. And at this point, I'm actually going to get uh, down to my lunch. I hope you were having lunch while joining, listening into the discussion, and we look forward to any comments. I thank also the comments that have arrived. Uh, and uh, yes, we, we agree on the fact that it is, it is important to, to keep the discussion going, and we look forward to keeping the discussion with you. Buon appetito. Speak to you soon. Bye. <laughs>